ಶಾಂತಿರಂತರಿಕ್ಷಗಂಶಾಂತೇರ್ಜಶಾಂತೇರ್ದಿಶಾಂತಿರವಾಂತರ್ದಿಶಾಂತಿರಾಧಿತ
we can meditate in any way we have been taught. To remain focused, we can take the help of a short mental prayer or a mantra or a divine name. Let us now spend some time dwelling on the presence of God in our hearts. Shanti 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 Hari Om Keshava Kuru on the last page of the book.
ओम असतोमा सत्कमया तमसोमा ज्योतिर्गमया मृत्योर्मा अमृतम गमया आवीरावीर्मे थी रुद्रयत्ते दक्षिण मुखम तेन माम पाहि नित्यम May the divine lead us from the unreal to the real from darkness to light from death to immortality may the divine consciousness fill our hearts and protect us <coughs> our topic today is chaitanya mahaprabhu his birthday according to the lunar calendar falls tomorrow that's on a full moon night those of us who have been reading about ramakrishna's life and teachings find that his name pops up now and then and that quite a number of times throughout his conversations in fact there is a great similarity in many ways not only in their teachings but but also in how their life evolved from childhood Chaitanya was born in the 15th century and born in the year 1486 he was born in a lunar eclipse day in a place called Mayapur uh, in a town of Navadvip which is about 75 miles north of Calcutta in Nadia district of Bengal his father was a very learned pandit named Jagannath Mishra and uh, his mother's name was Sachi Devi at that time Navadvip the place where he was born was a great center of trade and learning especially in a system of logic called navya nyaya nyaya as some of you might know is um, one of the six orthodox systems of philosophy in the indian subcontinent chaitanya was the the 10th child in the family after eight daughters and all of whom had died in in infancy Uh, so his elder brother was named vishwaroop who left home at the age of 16 and became a monk so when chaitanya was born his ne he was named vishwambhara um, according to the sometimes more so in the early days but to some extent even today oftentimes in in india when a baby is born they have a horoscope drawn and often time they will depend i don't understand anything of astrology but depending on some calculation that they do they'll sometimes suggest that for this baby give a name beginning with this letter and that uh, assures that a baby will have a, a long happy life and so usually the your choice gets restricted to whatever letter was dictated by the horoscope and so but often time what does end up happening is um, parents and family often have some other ideas about what to name the child so usually you'll have one horoscope name and then there'll be another name that will be kind of will become your official name which get used uh, used in your school records etc and then often times then the nickname would be yet different so people usually end up having three or four different names um so his his um, horoscope name was vishwambhara i'm sure none of you know what was horoscope name of ramakrishna anyone it's huh no no it's there it's there in that big book uh, by swami sharadananda so his horoscope name was shambhu chandra yeah and gadadhari was named because his father went to the temple in gaya where the vishnu is known known as gadadhar and that's where he had that vision that's why he was called gadadhar and then the family named him ramakrishna so he also had a bunch of names in fact uh, uh, vishnu uh, and in fact there are many many of the hindu deities vishnu has a whole hymn called vishnu sahasranama there are thousand names so there is a thousand names for shiva and thousand names of devi 
So there is no shortage of names. And um, uh, so anyway, so his his horoscope name was with Vishwambara. Um, but but his mother, so this was the horoscope name, but the mother named him Nimai. Now Nimai, the word literally means short-lived. That would seem to be a very strange sort of name to give to a baby. Um, the, literally, the word Nimai, there's, so you probably heard of the neem tree. So the word also refers to the bitter taste of the fruit and leaves of the neem tree. Now, why, why, would, why would anyone name a child that way? There is a belief in India that um, um, if there's been a kind of a persistent tragedy in the family, like now the eight of their uh, daughters had passed away in infancy, and so, so that this child also should not pass away, so oftentimes they will um, do something which will create an undesirable association with the child to kind of keep calamity away. And so, so the boy was named uh, Nimai. Um, I don't know whether a similar uh, belief uh, persists all over the world. Sometimes in India, uh, a baby, they'll, they'll, if there are any guests are going to come or you're going to take the baby out, they'll dress up the baby well and everything, and then they'll put some big black spot somewhere here. <laughs> Just show that there's the... Uh, is there any English word to refer to that? It's a nazar, nazar lag, lag jana? Okay. To ward off some, like, um, ward off uh, evil, evil eye. Yeah. So, and so this is one other way. So name a child this way so that no one will then, that evil eye won't be cast and the child will live long. That was the idea. Um, but because of his handsome appearance and shining complexion, he was also called Gauranga. Uh, that means the, the golden colored one. When he received his sacred thread. <clears throat> you see a bunch of names already. Uh, there is a belief because in later life we see he became such a great devotee of Krishna. Now the word Krishna in Sanskrit uh, means black. Uh, so he was very, Krishna was a very dark complexion he had. And Radha who is associated with his name, she had a very golden, shining complexion. And so devotees of Chaitanya uh, often say that, uh, that when Chaitanya was born, he in one body, both Krishna and Radha came together. So he had the, the wisdom of Krishna and the color of Radha. That's how sometimes in devotional texts, they see Chaitanya as a combination of Krishna and Radha. And he's, he got the name Krishna Chaitanya later when he embraced monastic life. Uh, he was, we read in his life, a very naughty kid um, and also very short-tempered. But nevertheless was loved by everyone in his neighborhood. And as I go on narrating some of these things, you might find parallels in Ramakrishna's life as well. Of he was a very mischievous, naughty kid in growing up in the village in Kamarpukur and yet was loved by, by everyone. Uh, we see in his life a series of conversions that occurred. Now, this is kind of a, <clears throat> a recurring pattern we see in the lives of these great mystics and saints that um, some, we can, it's possible to point oftentimes to some specific periods of their lives or specific incidents when kind of a quantum jump took place, a kind of a, uh, a deepening of their life took place. And this is not something only associated with these people whom we see as great people. To some extent we can see this may be true of our own lives as well. While we sometimes think of our lives as just kind of even apparently a pe apparently a mediocre life without any great drama occurring in our average life. But even in our own lives, we will see, it may be possible to look back at our lives and find some turning points, some things which 
propelled us in a certain direction. So one such thing that happened, the very first thing that happened in, uh, let me just call him Nimai for a, for the while until he becomes Shaitanya. So in Nimai's life was <coughs> when his older brother left and became a monk. So his older brother's name, as I said, was Vishwarup. So he became monk at the age of 16. And at that time, Nimai, who was the younger brother, the family noticed that he became serious. He stopped playing all his pranks and became very serious. And then he focused all his attention on studies and scholarship and became a, one of the eminent scholars of his time in that part of India. And he later started a school of his own. <clears throat> then a second conversion took in his place in his life when he had visited Gaya to offer, uh, make offerings to his ancestors. Uh, it is a custom in the Hindu tradition that uh, annually um, and uh, usually on the death ceremonies of their parents and grandparents and so on, there are certain rituals that are done. And many Hindus feel that at least once in their lifetime, it will be good to go to this place, Gaya, which is especially known for making these offerings to one's ancestors. In fact, um, it is also believed that if someone goes to Gaya and makes these uh, offerings to the ancestors, that is so powerful, so potent, so enduring, that one then is exempt from having to do it every year afterwards. And so such is the importance of this place, Gaya, which is where also Ramakrishna's father had gone to make offerings to his ancestors. And that is where he had that vision of Gadadhar Vishnu. And that's why the child was named Gadai. So when he had gone there and as he stood before the deity, uh, his heart suddenly became filled with love for God. And he was so overwhelmed by that that he was about to lose consciousness. At that time, an ascetic named Ishwar Puri came forward and, and supported him and helped him. And the touch of that great saint brought about a great transformation in this um, Gauranga or Nimai's life. It is said at that point, all the pride that he had in his scholarship, everything disappeared and he requested this great saint named Ishwar Puri to show him the way to, to Krishna. And after a few days, the saint initiated him with the Krishna mantra. Uh, so when Nimai returned after that back to uh, Navadvip, he was not able to teach any longer. He closed his school down. In fact, there is a story that he had written a very learned manuscript on the school of philosophy known as Nav Nav Navyanaya. And a friend of his, who was also a scholar, had also written another book on the same philosophical, another philosophical treatise. But when he saw the manuscript that, that Nimai had written, so this friend said, oh, your book is so awesome, so great, that once this gets published, or whichever way, they, I don't know whether printing was there that time, maybe, probably they just had to make handwritten manuscripts. But once people come to know about your book, no one is going to read my book. <clears throat> and then the story goes on to say that Nimai, by which time this big change had already occurred in, into him, he took his manuscript and then I just threw it into the Ganga and said, okay, this book is not coming out, let your book come out. <clears throat> and then he started <clears throat> emphasizing the repeating of God's name. He himself spent most of his time just remaining immersed in the thought of Krishna and repeating his name. And whoever came to him, whoever was inspired by his life, he said, all you need to do is just remember the Lord and keep repeating his name. <clears throat> so he had a, a great disciple named Nityananda. 
And oftentimes seen in Vaishnava circles, in devotional circles, uh, he is identified with, with Balrama, who was Krishna's older brother. So it's, it's sometimes <coughs> not unusual in the, in the Indian tradition, oftentimes when we have these great saintly figures come in to speculate about who they must have been in their previous life. If it's believed that the same Lord comes down again and again in different forms, and so oftentimes these um, speculations are done. There's no way to prove or disprove it, it's just a matter of belief. So they believe that Nityananda was a great student and associate of, of Chaitanya, was really Balram, the older brother of, of Krishna. So Chaitanya asked him, asked um, Nityananda to go and uh, encourage people to not forget God, to keep on repeating. So they would knock from uh, door to door and say, have you remembered the Lord today? Remember, chant his name. And so there is a story about two brothers whose name was Jagai and Madhai. They were the local crooks. They, everybody was afraid of them, and they were just they, they were terrible people. And so when the, this Nityananda went and knocked on their door, and they were fully drunk, and just opened and said, and he said, have you taken the name of the Lord? And they were so mad and furious at him. They didn't believe in all of this. And then one of them <clears throat> takes one other other part, and then just hits it on, on this Nityananda's head, and all the blood starts oozing. And, um, and when the news reaches uh, Chaitanya, he is furious. Um, and so Nityananda goes and then pleads with Chaitanya and says, no, please forgive them. Uh, they'll be okay. And then these two brothers who by that time had realized that, you know, it's violently attacking people, probably is more common now than then. I don't know why, but, but these people suddenly felt like, no, 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 this is something not right. And so they came, and they were even more surprised that rather than anyone taking action against them, uh, they were saying, no, that's fine. No action will be taken. We just want you, nevertheless, no matter what you do, we still want you to remember the Lord and take his name. And then we see a great transformation came in the lives of these two people, and they became saints in their own right. <coughs> the third <coughs> conversion we see <coughs> in uh, Chaitanya's life was when he's, he remained immersed in this highest state, uh, remained immersed in a Krishna, Krishna Bhava, or Radha Bhava, really, to begin with, was when um, they have in, in the devotional schools, they have codified what are the kind of changes that occur in a person when the heart becomes filled with the love for God. Um, how the, the physical changes that occur, the, the psychological changes that occur. And oftentimes these are called bhavas. And they're called sometimes called maha, maha bhava. I mean, it's kind of a, the, the bhava, the changes in their most extreme form. And they have identified 18 such characteristics. And it was said that because Radha um, is seen as the embodiment of what giving oneself wholly to God means, and so she had them manifested all these 18 characteristics in her life at the time of Krishna. And so we read that they saw those same 18 characteristics in Chaitanya's um, life as well. And so in that state when he was, that was considered by his biographers as the third major uh, conversion experience. So his life progressively changing and uh, going at a deeper level. And, and of course, four or 500 years later, the same 18 characteristics were found in Ramakrishna's life when his teacher, Bhairavi Brahmani, uh, she came to teach him, show him the, the path of devotion. 
and then she identified all of those characteristics. And so Ramakrishna himself passed through the same Radha, Radha Bhava as Chaitanya had. It is believed in the worshippers of Krishna that before one receives the grace and blessings of Krishna, one must first receive the grace and blessings of Radha. That she is the one who opens the door to reaching Krishna. And so oftentimes in uh, devotional circles, those who worship Krishna first uh, try to propitiate Radha and then believe that through her grace, they will reach Krishna afterwards. And the fourth conversion that occurred in his life was about a year after his visit to Gaya, when Nimai was 24, and he was initiated into sannyasa by Keshava Bharati. And it was at that time, he was given the name Krishna Chaitanya. So that's how Nimai, Vishwambhara, Gauranga then finally became known as Sri Krishna Chaitanya, and then just in, for short, simply Chaitanya. And Mahaprabhu is a, is a title, not, none of these are like officially bestowed on him, but that's how he became known. Prabhu means the Lord or the Master, and Maha means the Great. So Chaitanya, the Great Master, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Um, we read later that he uh, made pilgrimages to many different parts of India. Uh, he went to Puri. There is a very famous and ancient temple of uh, Vishnu there, uh, Vishnu at Jagannath. And he went to Puri there. And there is a great scholar there named Sarvabhauma. And he wanted to go and meet with him. Uh, he was a very elderly, great scholar. So when Sarvabhauma saw this young monk named Ch Krishna Chaitanya, he was very pleased. And being aware of the scholarship of Sarvabhauma, uh, Chaitanya requested that he wanted to study with him. And Sarvabhauma then started teaching him one of the three pillars of, of Vedanta. It's called Brahma Sutra. And so Sarvabhauma started teaching him this text called the Brahma Sutra. And, and the story goes on to say that for three days he was explaining to him what the book was saying and Chaitanya just sat with a very blank face. And that can be pretty discouraging to a teacher when all the students have no reaction on the face at all. And so, and so then Sarvabhoma after three days asked him, I mean, trying to teach you this you, do you get it? Does any of this make sense to you? Or, or what? And then Chaitanya very humbly, he was not being sarcastic, but he was just stating the truth. Then Chaitanya says, uh, he says, what the book says is, seems to be pretty clear, but your explanation <laughs> doesn't, I'm not able to understand your explanation of what. And then Sarvabhama asked him, okay, you tell me what you have understood from this. And then when Chaitanya said, well, this is my understanding of it. And then Sarvabhama then bowed before him and said, it's more right that you be my teacher and I become your student. And you see a beautiful meeting of, uh, of two great scholars uh, and um, the humility that each of them had. There's also a, a test that sometimes some books mention that Sarvabhama wanted to test his student, and he asked him to, to, to take his tongue out and then placed a little bit of sugar on his tongue. And try doing it when you go home. Um, so what happens is, the, usually, the, it'll, the, it'll just get watered up. There'll, there'll be uh, the, the saliva or juices will come. Um, in fact, you don't even need to put sugar. You can even just think about it, <laughs> or think about any favorite dish that you like. Even before you put it in your mouth, you maybe already the mouth might start watering. But anyway, so he wanted to test uh, Chaitanya's uh, control over himself. And the story goes on to say that he put the sugar and it was just dry as ever, that he was able to have that control over himself.
Chaitanya, when he once uh, was in southern India, and so there is this story about one day he saw a man chanting the Gita in the southern part of India. And another man seated at a distance was listening and weeping. His eyes were swimming in tears. Chaitanya asked that other man, do you understand all this? The man said, no, revered sir, I don't understand a word of the text. Then, Krishna, then Chaitanya asked him, why are you crying? Then the devotee said, I see Arjuna's chariot before me. I see Lord Krishna and Arjuna seated in front of it, talking. I see this and I weep. This was that incident much later Ramakrishna had mentioned in his conversations. Chaitanya is also credited with identifying the spots in, in Vrindavan. Vrindavan is a, <clears throat> is a small town, it was a village in those early days, where it was known that it was in that part that Krishna had grown up as a child. Uh, but that's about it. But when Chaitanya visited that place, because he was a great mystic, he in, he had mystical visions and he was able to identify the exact spots where the different incidents in Krishna's childhood had taken place. So people who visit Vrindavan now, uh, the, the guides there are able to show exactly uh, this is where it happened, this is where this incident happened. And some people feel that, oh, this is just People who are skeptical tend to think, oh, these are just stories that are made up. But as far as the historical record goes, uh, those places were identified by Chaitanya in his mystical visions. Uh, later, uh, <coughs> uh, his disciples, uh, his disciples, the lineage is known as the Goswami uh, Sampradaya. And so his disciples, Rupa, Rupa Goswami, Sanatan Goswami, and Jiva Goswami, uh, they were great scholars, and so they formulated, they took Chaitanya's teachings and formulated a philosophy. It became a, a school of, uh, in, um, a devotional school in the Vedanta tradition, and the philosophy is called as Achintya Bheda Bheda, which means inconceivable identity in difference. Bheda Abheda, Achintya Bheda Abheda. Um, so scholarly, very scholarly as those texts are, Chaitanya has gotten identified, although he himself was a great scholar and this philosophy itself is very intricate, but he has become identified not so much with intellectual and scholarly work, but through his overflowing love for God. And so we see that aspect of his being emphasized again and again throughout his life, by his biographers, and by later teachers as well. So I would like to read to you a few words of Ramakrishna from the Gospel of the Ramakrishna, what, the things that he spoke about Chaitanya. So this is what Ramakrishna said, quoting Chaitanya. He said, The name of God has very great sanctity. It may not produce an immediate result, but one day it must bear fruit. It is like a seed that has been left on the cornice of a building. After many days, the house crumbles and the seed falls on the earth, germinates and at last bears fruit. That is the beauty and power of the divine in our lives. Sometimes we may notice that we may read some book or hear about spiritual life from someone and at that time it may not may not make too much of an impression upon us. It might seem as if we have even forgotten it. But quite often it's been seen in life that sometimes months pass, years pass, and then some development occurs in one's life, uh, and then um, suddenly the memory comes, oh, this is what I heard, this is what I had read many years ago. And, uh, and then that seed, which was somehow been planted in our heart, then begins to grow and germinate. And so that's what, in the path of devotion, it is said, that whatever 
we hear, whatever we read, whatever we think about, which is related to spiritual life, is, is never wasted. Sometimes it may not seem to have an immediate effect, but sooner or later it will come and make our lives truly blessed. Chaitanya once said to Nityananda, Listen to me, brother. A person entangled in worldliness can never be free. The worldliness is a big, big subject. And we, this word occurs again and again in many Vedanta texts as well. What does it mean to be worldly? Am I worldly? If I think of myself as a spiritual person, um, how do I know whether I'm really spiritual? Now, being worldly does not mean being in the world. Everyone is in the world. Saints are in the world. Sinners are in the world. Well, <laughs> nobody is out of the world. So being in the world, we really don't have much choice right now. Where we do have choice is, is the world inside me. So what I will allow to go in me, in my own heart, that is where every one of us has a freedom. I can either fill my heart with things that are truly positive, healthy, which are not dependent on only this temporary, transitory nature of life, something that is more lasting, something that is more uplifting, or I can choose to fill my life with the same transitory, uh, temporary things of this world. So being worldly is not about being in the world, but being worldly is about the world being within me. So whether I should fill my heart with things related to spiritual life or things related to material life, that is a choice that every one of us has. Chaitanya was intoxicated with the love of God. Still, before taking to monastic life, for how many days did he try to persuade his mother to give him her permission to become a monk? He said to her, Mother, don't worry, I shall visit you every now and then. In, in many different ways you can see that this idea of this love, overflowing love, the, the, how to grow that love for everyone even when someone wants to be loving, is a big challenge. If we try to, I mean, there are just too many people around to kind of try to love everyone individually. It's, it may be possible to at least the, how many people we know, but it's a lot more difficult and it's a lot more time consuming and a lot more exhausting as well. A simple way we see in the life of Chaitanya and the, and the teachings of everyone that if we love God, through, in and through God, it is possible to love everyone. If our love for God is, comes from the heart, then all of our other relationships in life, they automatically get tinged with that love. They, get, they somehow become fulfilled through that love. In fact, in every relationship that we have, if if the higher ideal, if God has some role to play in every connection we make in life, then that connection, that relationship will be on a, on a, on a strong foundation. But any of the connections we try to make where God somehow has no place in it, then that will be always remain very shaky. That is what we read uh, in Chaitanya's life. And that is what the message that comes to us through all these different schools of devotion. The common teachings of Chaitanya and, and, and Ramakrishna are one, the, the supremacy and independence of bhakti. And that's very important because sometimes um, we think that applying reason and logic and all of that, like that is somehow a higher way of doing things. While the path of bhakti or love, some people tend to, tend to dismiss it 
uh, just just sentimentality or just kind of an emotional exuberance and what chaitanya's life and ramakrishna and all these other i mean i'm just mentioning these two names but this really is true of of all of these great great teachers uh, throughout history is that they showed that love of god doesn't have to depend on intellectualism or scholarship it's an it's an independent path it's it's a path in its own right it's possible to not be a scholar of any sort it's possible to not even be reading any books and yet we can reach that highest um goal in spiritual life and that is what what uh, chaitanya's life we see and those of us who have tried to take spiritual life seriously know that sometimes too much of intellectualism too much of emphasis on logic and rationality can good as it is valuable as it is can sometimes just make the heart very dry um and so a a healthy combination by which there is a plenty of scope to apply logic and reason in life but also the development of the heart the true love these are the two things that will um protect in some ways or prevent the the error that we can fall into because the path of knowledge can sometimes end up if we are not careful if it's done in a haphazard way into just kind of a dry intellectual gymnastics and similarly even the path of love and path of devotion again if it, that is not practiced in a proper way if that is done in a haphazard manner might just end up being just well kind of a sentimental nonsense so the only way to prevent these rather um the detours that can occur if you are not careful is to try to combine it together to balance each other out and so it's so much more helpful that in our own personal spiritual life we have a place for love of god as well as a very rational philosophical way to understand that higher truth the second thing that chaitanya emphasized was the power of the divine name and the importance of chanting the names and glories of god through japa and kirtana through singing and that's why uh, music and singing is a integral part of the satsangs that we have on on every sunday the music is as important or even more important than whatever other things that we do at the vedanta center the third thing that chaitanya thought was about the importance of morality and chastity that a strong spiritual life can be built only on a, a robust foundation of morality and, and chastity because without morality without chastity uh, no spiritual life is possible and we see that uh, emphasized in chaitanya's life fourth was about service as worship um sometimes the in the vaishnava circles it goes it gets described as serving other vaishnavas and so people who sometimes take a very constricted view of that teaching means serving other devotees and then like ignoring all the other people but that's that was not the uh the intent behind what uh, what chaitanya taught and later of course we see in our own life when um, vivekananda through the path of karma yoga he showed how service there is a better way to do service than merely looking upon it as a form of social work that if it's true that god is present in everyone then and if we remember that truth then every day every moment we are encountering god so god is not to be thought of a being only in a certain places that god is everywhere and we are encountering god in many different forms 
So whatever I do to help these different forms in which God appears to me in daily life, it might seem as service externally, but internally it is a form of worship. And finally, God realization is the goal of life and everything else should be geared to the supreme goal. And that was one of the very central teachings of Chaitanya. Now what God realization means, how that term is to be interpreted, we might have our own ways of figuring that out. But to the idea was that the life that the world that we see with our five senses, if I believe that this is all that there is, there is nothing beyond it, then it, it's possible, of course, people can have that idea. But if I see myself as a, as a spiritual person, then I have got to ask myself, do I really believe that there is anything beyond the world that my senses are able to grasp and my mind is able to think about? It, if I believe there is, then there is some hope that I might be able to break this barrier and, and find that transcendent truth. And all these great teachers like Chaitanya and others, through many of these different philosophies, different traditions, uh, have showed us different ways of, of breaking that ceiling, so to speak, which has been put upon us through the limitations of our own senses and the mind. So there is a lot, lot to uh, read and understand and be inspired in Chaitanya's life. And that is what we generally try to do here in Vedanta, that remembering the lives of these great ones, seeing how what they taught relates to our own life, relates to our own idea about the world, how we can learn from them, how we can be inspired by them, and how we can make our own lives truly blessed. Om Jananim Saratam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Padapadme Tayo Shritva Pranamami Muhur Muhu. Next Sunday, we will have Antar Yoga, as we do every month. Uh, we'll have spiritual readings, um, reflection, music, and also we'll celebrate the birthdays of everyone born in the month of March. So all of you are welcome next Sunday for Antar Yoga. On this Wednesday, we will not have the study group meeting. Uh, we'll meet uh, next Wednesday. And on Tuesday and Saturday, the meditation will continue as usual. Uh, there's one uh, small thing about um, the, the virus. You must have heard that there is some virus going around. Um, and already there's, there's, you know, when, when, the, when the news of the virus makes headlines and not politics, even though it's, the elections are just eight minutes, eight, eight months away, uh, we know that this is something that we need to take seriously. Um, although I, I'm, I'm quite certain that there's been too much, too much um, information and what, what are the precautions we need to take. And though, although all of us are aware of it, I would just like to say that to 
please uh, that we all should take seriously the thing there is not much that we can do in terms of medication uh, but eventually some kind of a vaccine or it might come but till that time um, let us try to follow some of these simple procedures that have been uh, recommended by all experts in the field so make sure that you uh, wash your hands as often as possible with soap for a minimum of 20 seconds that's important not just just so. um, and then and then just follow the the common sense precautions we take also um, if you feel sick um, please stay home so that since not, we may not know what what's happening so just for the sake of precaution if you feel sick any day uh, stay at home so what we are trying at the Vedanta Center, as I'm sure at many other places also, we're trying our best to keep the community as safe as possible. And so I uh, request your cooperation that um, let's try to follow all the instruction so everyone in our community is happy, healthy, and safe. One other thing is about um, when you come in, sometimes um, um, if you are in a hurry to come in, you may not remember to close the front door and the front door opens and a lot of... Um, luckily, the winter hasn't been that bad yet. And I hope it's not anymore going further. But, but please remember to close the front door when you come in uh, so that it doesn't open. Make sure that it's closed fully so that the heat is preserved inside. That's the important. So let's conclude with a prayer now. <clears throat> oh. May the divine being, who is the Father in heaven of the Christians, Holy One, of the Jewish faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, Aura Mazda of the Zoroastrians, the Great Spirit of the Native Americans, and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May we be granted strength, freedom, and clear understanding. May we learn to see God in our own hearts and in everyone around us. May God bless us all and fill our hearts with gratitude, grace and love. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace be unto